Good evening. My name is Shin Yi Pai, and I'm the program director at Town Hall. On behalf of the staff at Town Hall Seattle and our friends at Elliott Bay Book Company, it's my pleasure to welcome you to our presentation with Jules Boykoff and Bill Radke. Boykoff's book, No Olympians, Inside the Fight Against Capitalist Megasports in Los Angeles, Tokyo, and Beyond, is the subject of tonight's talk. As we get underway, I would like to acknowledge our institution stands on the unceded traditional territory of the Coast Salish people, particularly the Duwamish. We thank them for our continuing use of the natural resources of their ancestral homeland. We're so glad to have you join us tonight. The presentation will run about 60 minutes, including Q&A. To, sub to submit your questions for the Q&A portion of the event, please enter meet.ps backslash boycoff or scan the QR code right now on the screen with your smartphone. We'll drop this link in the chat as well, and you can submit a question at any time. We'll try to get to as many questions as possible, and you can help us by keeping your own question concise. Also a reminder, if you'd like to view the program with closed captions, click the CC button in the bottom right corner of the video player. Town Hall is adding new events and podcasts every day. Upcoming events include Howard W. French with Drago Little, discussing a vital reframing of world history that centers Africa and African people, and Amy B. Zegart with Ross Reynolds on the history and future of espionage in the U.S. Visit our website to join our email list and get the latest updates as more programs are added throughout the season. Town Hall's work is made possible through your support and the support of our sponsors. Our civic series is supported by Real Networks Foundation and True Brown Foundation. Town, <clears throat> Town Hall is also a member supported organization. So I'd like to thank all the members who are joining us. If you share Town Hall's vision of a community strengthened by discussions about civic science and culture where everyone has a voice, please consider supporting us by donating or becoming a member. Lastly, you'll absolutely want to dig into tonight's topic by purchasing your own copy of the author's book. Please use the link in the chat below to pick up your copy through Elliott Bay Book Company. Jules Boykoff is the author of five books on the Olympic Games, including the forthcoming title, The 1936 Berlin Olympics, Race, Power, and Sports Washing. No Olympians, Inside the Fight Against Capitalist Megasports in LA, Tokyo, and Beyond, and Power Games, The Political History of the Olympics. His writing on the Olympics has appeared in places like the New York Times, the LA Times, The Guardian, The Washington Post, and The Nation. Jules teaches political science at Pacific University in Oregon. Bill Radke is the host of Week in Review on KUOW. He's been a host on KUOW's The Record and American Public Media's Weekend America and Marketplace Morning Report. Please join me in welcoming Jules Boykoff and Bill Radke. I'll start, Shinyi. Thank you so much. It's great to be with you. Thank you, Town Hall. Thank you to Jules Boykoff. Thank you for watching and listening. And I'd love to get to a, a question of yours. So just send them along. Please do. So how you doing? Are you excited about the upcoming Beijing Olympics opening ceremonies on Friday? A lot of us look forward to these games as a celebration of excellence, celebration of worldwide cooperation, and it's just fun to watch a bobsled. But if that's the only part of the Olympics you pay attention to, then you are covering one eye. The White House said in December, quote, the Biden administration will not send any diplomatic or official representation to the Beijing 2022 Winter Olympics and Paralympic Games, given the People's Republic of China's ongoing genocide and crimes against humanity in Xinjiang and other human rights abuses. Also diplomatically boycotting the games are Canada, the UK, Australia, and others. So why is a country accused of genocide, crimes against humanity, and human rights abuses hosting an event whose charter says its goal is to place sport at the service of the harmonious development of humankind with a view to promoting a peaceful society concerned with the preservation of human dignity. Are these boycotting governments characterizing China fairly, or is this part of their geopolitical rivalry with China? Is China significantly, if China is significantly more abusive than other countries, why are they hosting the games for the second time in 14 years? My guest has definite opinions on all this and more. As you heard, Jules Boykoff has written critically about the Olympics for some time, and his newest book is called No Olympians, Inside the Fight Against Capitalist Mega Sports in Los Angeles, Tokyo, and beyond. Jules, it's a real treat to be talking to you tonight. Oh, it's great to be with you, Bill. What a terrific setup you just gave. Well, thank you. Uh, Jules, as uh, was mentioned, is a politics and government professor, Pacific University. I don't think you're anti-sports. You played on the U.S. under-23 men's national soccer team. So before we really get into it, I just want to know, are you going to watch the Olympics? 
I am ready for the Olympics to arrive. And yes, there are some events that I'm definitely looking forward to and some athletes that I'm looking forward to see grace the screen as well. Okay. So let's get into uh, the issues that I just raised that you have covered so well over the year than in your, your newest book. First of all, how accurate is the Biden administration's brief against China? It seems accurate. It's based on evidence from around the world. Human rights groups have been following what's been happening in China for some time now. They have said that they believe that crimes against humanity are happening in China as we speak, as the Olympics are about to start. That is actually a technical human rights term that emerged out of the International <laughs> Criminal Court creation in the Rome Statute. And so it's not just something that they're dashing out of their mouths there. If you look at what's happening in Xinjiang, it's basically an open air prison for people who are Uyghur Muslims for and Turkic Muslims. If you look back a little bit further in history, you'll know about the suppression of Tibetans that lasts all the way through today. And of course, a lot of people will also be thinking about the suppression of democracy activists in Hong Kong. And so all those suppressive activities are real. And as you indicated, Bill, they clash mightily with the lofty principles that are in the Olympic Charter. Now, Chinese officials claim they're just responding to territorial incursions and to security threats posed by separatist groups. How much, if any, of the American uh, Beijing critique in Australia and UK, as I said, how, how much of this is politics? How much of this is about geopolitical rivalry? I think a lot of it is about politics. There's no question that the Olympics are about a lot more than the Olympics. And they're arriving right now in a period of escalating tensions between the United States and China that have two very different worldviews about how to proceed in this world. And it was interesting to me to see that when the Biden administration declared this diplomatic boycott, not an athlete boycott, but a diplomatic boycott, how few countries actually jumped on board. And that said two things to me, Bill. Uh, one, it said that there's a lot of support for China out there. Nobody really wants to go out of their way to cross China in this moment. When individual companies have done so, whether it's Nike raised questions about what's happening in Xinjiang in terms of the production of cotton or Muji or H&M, China has actually come back hard at those companies. And so countries are aware of that history and they don't necessarily want to cross China, this rising global power who knows what they're doing. On the other side, I think it also points to the waning influence of the United States right now. I don't think it's too far to go to say that United States democracy is essentially on a ventilator right now. And people in the United States know that. If you look at current polling from Gallup to Ipsos, you'll see that people are very concerned right here in the United States with democracy and how it's playing out and how it's being maybe shattered right in front of our eyes. And people in China are fully aware of what's happening in the United States. And they have waggled a finger back at the United States saying, what about those kids in cages? What about your unquestioning support for Israel, no matter what's happening to Palestinians? Uh, what about all these other issues that you have in, in the country? In Seattle, just like in Portland, where I'm coming to you from, human, there's a, the homelessness is a humanitarian crisis in plain sight. And so it's not as if the United States doesn't have serious human rights problems of its own. It's just that we're not hosting the Olympics right now. Okay, so you say some of this uh, lack of outcry uh, is about people not wanting to cross China. Some of it is about, well, the U.S. is, uh, as you say, accused of a lot, war crimes, crimes against humanity, et cetera. Um, but how much of it is, is really um, fans and governments agreeing with the defenders of the Olympics who say it's actually that the games are games and it's about the athletes and we should separate the sporting event from the misdeeds of the various hosts. Right, so the International Olympic Committee has long lived by the idea, I think it's fair to call it a myth, that the Olympics are not political and that they can actually maintain some measure of neutrality. The International Olympic Committee says that they can. I tend to fall down on the side of Archbishop Desmond Tutu, who once wrote that if you are neutral in situations of injustice, you have chosen the side of the oppressor. So in this case, if the International Olympic Committee chooses to be neutral in the face of injustice, they have chosen the side of the oppressor. Neutrality can sometimes be a form of bias, and these Olympics are a perfect example of that. I think there is a lot of support for letting the athletes go ahead and participate, even though the Olympics are happening in a country with serious human rights problems. 
I think a lot of what people experienced in the United States in the 1980s with the Moscow Olympics, where athletes were boycotted because of the Jimmy Carter administration's decisions. And uh, basically, there's a lot of negative feelings out there. Athletes who have asterisks next to their names because of those Olympics, they have been vociferous in their disagreement with that approach. And that has really soured the mouths of a lot of people in the United States who now don't want to see an athlete boycott. And of course, that's not what we're looking at here. So I think in some ways, we can support the athletes while still raising questions about these Olympic Games. In other words, I think we need not devote ourselves to the death of complexity. We can do both of those things at the same time. And the Beijing Olympics kind of demands that we do. So you say, you, you quote um, Desmond Tutu saying to be neutral is to side with the oppressors, yet you're not called. So why aren't you calling for an athlete ban? Now you said that, that it falls on the athletes, but wouldn't that price to pay be an example of um, putting this oppression above the interests of, of even athletes? So, so be it. Yeah, I mean, first, let me just say, Bill, I think this is a really complicated and difficult question. And there will be people on either side with their answers with this. And I re have respect for those who fall on either side of this equation. The way I view it is that athletes had nothing to do with the selection of Beijing as the host city. One. Two, Olympic athletes already do not do very well economically, certainly not from the United States. Many of them set up GoFundMe campaigns to realize their Olympic dreams, in fact. And there was a really interesting and important study that came out of Ryerson University in Canada in conjunction with this really interesting progressive startup athlete group called Global Athlete. And what they did was they compared the revenues from the Olympics to other major sports like the NFL, the National Hockey League, the uh, English Premier League of Football, Major League Baseball, and so on. And what they found was with those other leagues, athletes received between 45 and 60% of the revenues, 45 to 60%. With the Olympics, it's 4.1% of the revenues. That is so incredibly different. And so it's already the athletes are getting the short end of the money stick. So to then pull out entirely and not even allow them to get those scraps in addition to the kind of uh, benefits that they would get in terms of sponsorships after the Olympics, should they be successful, seems a little bit cruel to do to people who had nothing to do with the selection in the first place. In fact, there have been numerous athletes who are Beijing bound, some of whom are already there, who have said out loud that they don't think Beijing should be given the Olympics and shouldn't have got them, but they have a job to do and they're there to do it. Okay, so you're not calling for a, an athlete boycott. What about the diplomatic boycott, small as it is? What does it accomplish? Does anybody care if the US or anyone sends a diplomatic Olympic delegation? Well, the diplomatic boycott's intention is to raise up the issues around human rights that are happening in the wider host country. And that has certainly been achieved. Going into these Olympics, that has been one of the major storylines in the media thus far. The goal of the Biden administration is to prevent what a lot of people these days are calling sports washing, which is to say when a country hosts a major mega event in sports like the Olympics, like the Soccer World Cup, as a way of laundering their stained reputation on the world stage. I mean, these Olympic Games are full of grin and grip photo ops where you have all these dignitaries standing next to each other looking important. And what that does is, it sort of gives off an air of legitimacy to the host city and host country. And so the Biden administration is trying to undercut that possibility of sports washing. Is it going to be effective beyond that in terms of getting China to change its ways? Very probably not. But even if something isn't necessarily effective, at least the Biden administration can say it has beliefs, it's acting on those beliefs, so its sentiments and actions are aligned. And you know, in this world, I think there's something to be said for that as well. If China is so much worse than the rest, we've talked about the uh, United States, uh, the, the accusation of crimes against humanity by the United States government. If China is generally a very bad actor, then why don't host countries ban Chinese athletes when, whenever a host country is, is, uh, you know, is, is hosting the games? I would think it, that would be more effective is because citizens don't like their athletes getting shut out of the Olympic Games. Talk about an uproar in China if you really wanted to stir things up. 
Yeah, that's a really interesting question. And first, let me just say that I don't believe in U.S. exceptionalism when it comes to the Olympic Games. I think the same standards around human rights should be applied to the United States. And I think as we get closer to the 2028 Olympics in Los Angeles, you're going to hear more and more voices raising issues around U.S. human rights abuses. I didn't even mention Guantanamo Bay, for example, uh, where you've had torture, just straight up torture carried out by the US government there. The whole world knows about this. This is not some kind of secret. And so these conversations will continue around human rights and hosting events uh, such as this one. In terms of boxing out athletes from the Olympics themselves, if a host government that is hosting the Olympic Games were to do that, they would face the full ire of the International Olympic Committee. And what we learned last summer when Tokyo hosted the Olympics there during a pandemic when around 80% of the population, according to some local polls, did not want to have the Olympics because of coronavirus and other concerns, what we learned from Tokyo was that when it comes to the host city contracts that host cities sign with the International Olympic Committee, they hand over a lot of power to the IOC, the International Olympic Committee. We know this because now the host city contracts are being released in public and we can see the clauses right there in themselves. But we also know it because at Tokyo, the prime minister at the time, Yoshihide Suga, said he was under pressure from his locals to like, hey, why are you having all these people come in? We're not even fully vaccinated, not even close to it at that time in Japan. This is going to be really dangerous for us. And those people were right. The, the rates skyrocketed during the Olympics of coronavirus. Well, Suga said to the population, hey, there's nothing I can actually do. Take a look at this host city contract. We don't have the power to terminate the Olympic Games. The International Olympic Committee does. So my point is just that if a host city of the Olympics were to try to start excluding certain athletes from this country or that country, you can bet that the International Olympic Committee would come down hard. And the International Olympic Committee has a lot of serious cards uh, in their vest pocket. Again, this is Jules Boykoff. The book is No Olympians Inside the Fight Against Capitalist Mega Sports in Los Angeles, Tokyo, and Beyond. We'll talk more about Los Angeles in a little bit. But uh, before we leave Beijing, why is Beijing hosting the Games again? I'm really glad you asked that because thinking back to what happened in 2015 actually helps us see a lot of what's wrong with the Olympics in the 21st century. So if we rewind the tape to 2015, there were actually numerous cities <clears throat> that were keen to host the 2022 Winter Olympics from powerhouses of winter sport like Oslo and Stockholm to lesser known entities, kind of upstarts like Lviv, Ukraine, Almaty, Kazakhstan. Munich was showing some interest for a while. Grabunden in Switzerland was showing some interest for a little while. But here's what happened, Bill. The word was just starting to get out during that time period that the Olympics have a lot of downsides that affect every single Olympic hosts, not just Tokyo, not just Beijing, but all Olympic hosts. And those trends, which are becoming much more talked about in the public sphere, are overspending, we saw that in Tokyo. Those games were supposed to cost $7.3 billion. In the end, they cost closer to $30 billion. So overspending is one trend. The militarization of public space. In other words, the host city and country use the sports mega event of the Olympics as a chance of upping their supplies of weapons and special laws that they would never be able to get during normal political times. And those stay on the books, of course, after the games and are used in normal policing afterwards. A third trend that more and more people were learning about as the bidding was happening around 2022 was gentrification and forced eviction. Last time Beijing hosted the Olympics, they displaced a whopping, almost unfathomable 1.5 million people were displaced from their homes for the 2008 Summer Olympics in Beijing. And finally, more people were learning about this idea of greenwashing, talking a big game when it comes to environmental sustainability, but actually not following through. I mean, the previous Winter Olympics in Pyeongchang, South Korea, cut down a 500 year old ancient forest to make way for a ski run for those Olympic Games, much to the disgruntlement of locals there who are none too happy about that. And so all this information was coming into the public sphere. And all of a sudden you had all these populations in places like Oslo, Stockholm and elsewhere saying, wait a second, we want to talk more about this. We're going to use public money for this kind of thing. And, and so basically through time, there were a number of public referendums that happened. And in those referendums, voters said, heck no, we don't want the Olympics. So one by one, these cities started to drop off. 
it didn't help matters bill that oslo released some information some private information demands by the international olympic committee that were really kind of outrageous requests that kind of pointed to the ioc's thoughts on their own importance let's just say for example the ioc was telling oslo that they needed to be able to meet privately with the king of norway they needed to uh, have private exits and entrances into the airport when they were arriving in norway if they were picked to host the olympic games all rooms for meetings had to be held at 20 degrees celsius at all times and so you know all of these really demands that showed the privilege that they expect when they arrive in the host city didn't do them any favors as well. And so you had all these bid cities drop out, leaving only Beijing and Almaty, Kazakhstan, neither of them necessarily a bastion of democracy. And just think for a second, Bill, if they would have gone with Almaty, what's going on in Kazakhstan right now with the bloodshed in the streets that's happening there. Instead, the IOC went with the entity that it knows, it went with Beijing, and it was a narrow vote, 44 to 40. And that's how we got to Beijing in the first place. But there's no question about it that in the 21st century, fewer and fewer cities are game to host the Olympic Games. And yet we just said that Los Angeles is slated to host. I think Brisbane is coming up. Uh, I've heard about the, the concerns you just mentioned for years. I remember all the displacement at, at the Rio de Janeiro Games. I remember the, 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 all the accusations of waste um, money we, we don't have in the Greek Olympics. <clears throat> Why, why does anybody host the Olympics? Why is Los Angeles hosting? Well, the simple question is because working people never make these bids. They're never grassroots bids that are saying, we want to have the Olympics in our city. It's always well-connected political and economic elites. And despite the fact of what I was saying before about overspending, what I've called in the past etch-a-sketch economics when it comes to the Olympics, meaning during the bid phase, they say it's only going to cost, in the case of Tokyo, $7.3 billion. They shake up that Etch-a-Sketch once they, once they get the Olympics, and then they write a brand new number on it, which is in, inevitably higher. Despite all that, there are still well-connected political and economic elites that want to make it happen. So when you talked about Los Angeles, there were a number of cities that were bidding on the 2024 Olympics. That, what we should remember, is what Los Angeles was initially bidding on, 2024 Summer Olympics. But then city after city started dropping out around the 2024 games. One interesting example is Rome, where a mayor, Virginia Raggi, was elected as the mayor of Rome on an anti-Olympics platform and she won and that bid was dust after that. So at the end of that process for the 2024 Olympics, there were only two cities standing, Paris and Los Angeles. And the International Olympic Committee did something very special. They decided that they were going to award both of those uh, cities Olympics by giving Paris 2024 and Los Angeles 2028. Never been done before like that. And so now you mentioned Brisbane, that's another really interesting example. Like Los Angeles, they were handed the Olympics 11 years in advance of hosting. That's important for a number of reasons. First of all, for a long time, there was only a seven year lag between getting handed the Olympics and then actually staging and delivering the Olympic games. Now it's 11 years. And what's that done for Brisbane is that it means that there was really no democratic discussion around whether to host the Olympics there in Brisbane, Australia. Instead, it was a closed door kind of thing that happened with the International Olympic Committee, a small number of people, a non-transparent process, no locals really got much of a chance to say anything about it. And now Brisbane will host the Olympics. The thing about it is, Bill, like you were alluding to, you know, a lot of these cities have anti-Olympics movements that have cropped up in them. Los Angeles is a prime example. There's a group there called No Olympics LA, which is really causing a lot of havoc around the 2028 bid. And they have a lot of talented and committed people in that group, people who work in Hollywood and have serious skills when it comes to propaganda making, if you will. And they're not letting up anytime soon. Well, I would think Los Angeles already has a lot of infrastructure and a lot of stadiums, et cetera. Do you expect to see rampant overspending and more militarization than American police forces are already doing and, and, and more gentrification and displacement in Los Angeles? So that's a good question. In fact, when the Los Angeles was bidding on the 2028 Olympics, that was one of their biggest selling points was that we have a lot of the venues. We have all these professional sports teams as well, and we can use right. their stadium. So that was one of the big arguments. They called it a, quote, no build Olympics. But actually what's happened in the wake of them getting handed the Olympics is that there has been quite a bit of building. Hoteliers have been ramping up their hotel building. And this has led to displacement. So 
One of the arguments of the people from No Olympics LA, that activist group that I mentioned, has been that they're going to focus more on the gentrification and forced eviction of working class people, and they're going to focus more on the militarization of the police in Los Angeles. I probably would imagine that a lot of people will listening uh, to listening to us right now will know full well about the history of Los Angeles policing. It wasn't just Rodney King was not some one off in the early 1990s. They've long had problems around intense policing, intense racialized policing in Los Angeles, and what we're seeing there now is that officials in law enforcement are saying, because the Olympics are coming in 2028, we need more money, we need more officers. And so basically you're seeing that dynamic I identified before, where the Olympics basically become a Olympic City's cash machine when it comes to securitization, getting all those special weapons and laws they'd be having more trouble to get during normal political times. And so I think with Los Angeles, the, the issues that activists there are raising are less about the money, although they're certainly concerned with that. And let's be clear, Los Angeles is on the hook for cost overruns if that happens. And every single Olympics going back to 1960 for which there is reliable data has had cost overruns. But their concerns are more around militarization and gentrification and greenwashing. Well, here we are talking and I asked a few minutes ago, why does anybody host the Olympics? We've been well aware of these problems. And I see in the chat that, um, that someone is asking with more and more places dropping, what would make a city want to host the games? The fact that they're asking that after I just asked it makes me wonder, maybe you didn't quite tell the whole story if you're not talking about why legitimately some people are thrilled to have their city host the Olympics. It's, it's, uh, it's international visitors, it's, it's, it's great fun, maybe it's great pride to them. Isn't that part of the picture? Sure, and I don't want to undersell some of the positive elements of the Olympic Games. There is a feel-good factor with the Olympics often. So, for example, I lived in London during the lead-up to and during the 2012 London Olympics. And when I went around on the tube in London, people were in a better mood during the Olympics. People were actually nicer to each other. There was sort of a festive feeling in the air. They paid a lot of money for that festive feeling and they went way over budget for that festive feeling, but you can't deny that people did not enjoy themselves during the Olympic Games. Same, but a little bit less so for Rio. I also lived in Rio in 2015. I was a Fulbright Research Fellow there and I was there also for the 2016 Olympic Games. And there was a little bit of a feel good factor there as well. Again, much less so than I saw on the streets of London, that is for sure. So, I mean, there are positive qualities. Tourism is a little bit of a mixed bag. The academic research on tourism has found that actually it does not increase tourism in places where you already have tourism. So like London, I mentioned, or Rio or Los Angeles or Paris. In fact, the European Tour Operators Association, which I'm sure everybody follows online there, the European Tour Operators Association, which is like a trade group for European tour operators, they issued a report that said, don't get your hopes up about the Olympics. And this is not like some band of like Marxist economists or something like that. This is a trade publication that is trying to advise their members on not getting their hopes up. And, you know, I have to say, Bill, I saw this with my own two eyes in London, where I interviewed people who put all of their savings into making their restaurants bigger because they were told it was going to be this big payday with all these tourists arriving. And they did not have any Olympic tourists come through their area because they were just off of the Olympic grid. Olympic tourists are different than everyday tourists. The London theater scene was decimated during the Olympic Games. It is usually hopping in the summer. That's when they make a lot of their money for all these regular, if you will, tourists. Well, the regular tourists stay away. The economists have a fancy term for that. It's called the stay away factor. They stayed away. Olympic tourists did arrive and replace them with this what economists call substitution effect. But the Olympic tourists were just going to the Olympics and their hotel, maybe getting a bite to eat in that zone. They weren't going to the theater then later. So it's just a trade off in a lot of cases with these cities that already have a lot of tourism in them. OK, so Jules, you like watching some of these sports. You're not calling for a, an athlete boycott. Who should host the Olympics? Yeah, <laughs> who should? Yeah, I mean, that's a that's a great question. I mean, and I've and I've thought a lot about like who should get the Olympics to come to their town. And I mean, I think as it's currently constituted, some big questions remain why anybody would necessarily want to do so. Uh, I'm very sympathetic to the athlete workers who are also known as Olympians. 
and their worker labor situation inside of this rather unjust situation that I outlined before. And so getting rid of it entirely would undercut their ability to make money, especially in some of these lesser known sports like, say, the skeleton or the luge in the Winter Olympics uh, or, you know, some of these lesser known sports in the summer games. Uh, and so I don't necessarily want to just snap that uh, possibility away from these worker athletes, but something definitely needs to be done here. And I think that like taking the Olympics out of the hands of the International Olympic Committee would be a pretty decent place to start. Unless you think that I'm just coming out of left field here, uh, I've evolved in my position on this. I mean, I was asked in 2014 by the New York Times to write one of these sort of magic wand essays where you can, if you had a magic wand, how would you change the Olympic Games? And so I approached it in good faith back then in 2014. I put forth what I felt like were very fair uh, reforms, nothing too radical or spiky. Um, and every single thing that I suggested, even though it was totally reasonable, if you ask me, was absolutely ignored. And in fact, it wasn't just me, it was a lot of other critics who've raised questions about fairness for everyday people in the Olympic city who have been massively ignored every single step of the way. And who are we being ignored by? The International Olympic Committee. So they continue to do these Olympic Games that are unjust. And I say it might be just time to take it out of their hands and give it to maybe athletes, not just any athlete, but critically minded thinking athletes that are concerned about fairness in the Olympic city. Second, making the Olympics smaller. I mean, they suffer from an academics called gigantism right now. And I'm not sure I'd really wish these Olympics, these gigantic Olympics on any city. Uh, including like Rio de Janeiro that had to build these specialized runs for like whitewater kayaking that basically were being occupied by crocodiles and alligators almost a month or two after the Olympic Games and really haven't been used much since. I would not wish that upon anybody. We need to rethink the sports that are included in the Olympics. We need to think big right now because the Olympics are actually doing a lot of damage to these cities, damage that is ongoing in terms of maintenance costs and smashed lives. Smaller Olympics. So which sports are you kicking out? Oh, wow, you're going to get me in trouble now. I, I once wrote an essay just raising the question of fairness about how, you know, equestrian dressage and, and, and how dressage is basically for people that are, are watching that aren't familiar with it. That's basically kind of like horse ballet. And to uh, manage a, a horse that participates in dressage, it costs in the neighborhood of like $70,000 a year to keep that up. Mitt Romney, who uh, ran for president and, and now a senator from Utah, he actually had a horse called called Rafalka, who was in the 2012 Olympics in London. Somehow he can manage to afford it, I'm sure. But the, my point is not everybody can just like get their own Rafalka here and join up and figure out they can make their Olympic dream through equestrian dressage. And so I suggested, hey, maybe replacing the hat with a, a sport or, or getting rid of it entirely or replacing it with a sport where more countries can participate. How about the tug of war? I mean, actually, oddly enough, Bill, the tug of war was a very popular sport in the early days of the Olympics. It was maybe the most popular sport at the 1912 games in Stockholm, Sweden. The thing I like about the tug of war is that you basically need a rope and some muscly people that are willing to give it a go. I mean, that's pretty much all you need, right? A little bit of space. So any country could put together a tug of war team. And so I think that is what we need to start thinking about moving forward. Some of these sports are just basically elite sports. And I think maybe they've seen their time uh, and moving on to lesser costly sports, but also just getting rid of some of the sports and making the Olympics uh, carbon footprint and just general footprint smaller. How about just less fancy? Like how much is it just about, you know, fewer sports or as you say, more, um, more accessible, popular, accessible sports, but does the whole thing have to be so glammed up and state of the art and, you know, pe people can just play games against each other, right? For, for much less? That's another possibility. Absolutely. There are plenty of places that you could make cuts. I mean, the Tokyo Olympics taught us a lot of things, but they also taught us that. They made enormous amounts of cuts, in part because they had gone so far over budget, they were getting a lot of pressure from taxpayers inside of Japan. But they all of a sudden magically made cuts. Here's another place where I think you could make some cuts and not get too much public pushback. That is uh, the salaries and per diems of members of the International Olympic Committee. Bill, if you're a member of the executive board of the International Olympic Committee, 
and you show up to the Olympic Games, not only will you get to stay in the fancy five star hotel, not only will you get to enjoy those uh, free food festivals that you get to attend as an IOC executive board member, but you can also claim $900 in per diem every day. Nine hundred dollars in per diem. Can you imagine? So and if you're you not paying for food and hotel. Oh, yeah. No, this is more dollars gravy on top. And that's not to mention the administrative costs that you can claim up in the thousands of dollars. And so, you know, being a member of the International Olympic Committee can actually be more profitable than being a medal winning athlete from the United States. If you win a bronze medal, you might get paid less than some IOC member snoring in the fifth row of the diving competition or the, the downhill skiing competition and just sitting there making their money. I mean, it's obscene. So there's another place where you can make cuts. And I don't imagine there'd be too much pushback in any Olympic city on that one. We have an excellent question here that I, from a viewer that I wanna to pose to you. Just before we leave the question of uh, where should the Olympics be held, why not have it always in Greece? in Athens or where it would, obviously the Olympics are of Greek origin. It would save a lot of money. Other countries could contribute. Greece wouldn't have to pay for it all. And it would focus constant attention on these other concerns you mentioned. We'd always be looking at how the people of Athens are being treated by the Olympics instead of it always seeming, hey, it's new and different every time and it pops mm -hmm. up all over the place. Yeah, that's a totally fair question. And I guess the place I would start with the idea of placing the Olympics sort of permanently, if you will, in Athens is, I sort of wonder if the people of Athens would like that. I mean, I when they know. hosted in 20, 2004, uh, what's that, Bill? I saw, I'm sorry, I just say, I don't know whether they would or not either, but yes. Yeah, no, I mean, and my guess is there'd be some people that would definitely not want to. When they hosted in 2004, uh, they went way, way over budget. And a lot of folks said that it contributed to the downfall of the economy after that. Now we are talking about billions for the Olympics versus trillions in terms of the economy, uh, but it certainly didn't help matters there and it didn't make the Olympics very popular. I mean, there was a herd of white elephant stadiums that were left in the wake of those Olympics in Athens. What I mean by that is stadiums for like softball and other places that basically were sitting in disrepair from then on, but go ahead. Yeah, but, but well, I'm just saying that uh, on that point, th if it were the permanent home of the Olympics, they presumably wouldn't be white elephants anymore. They'd be used and not have to be built over and over again other places. Right, in theory, yes. And, and another, and, and so setting aside the issue of whether Athens would be keen, um, there's still the issue of having to rebuild. Now, some people do want to put them in Athens, and that would probably cut down on some of the fresh construction costs. On the other hand, some people have suggested and uh, that maybe having the Olympics in a rotation of like four or five cities, that way they could go around the world and that would still do what you're suggesting, Bill, which would be to cut down on, on construction costs, while at the same time kind of spreading it around and having it go around the globe. The issue with that is that unfortunately a lot of the stadiums that we build now become fossils basically after only a few years. Let's look at Atlanta. They hosted the 1996 Olympics, built a fresh Olympic stadium just for that. Only 20 years later, they rubbled that stadium because it was considered old, a fossil, useless. And now the new stadiums are so much fancier. So if they were on that rotation of every fifth Olympics, it was Atlanta, they'd still be building a new stadium anyways. So, you know, there's no easy answers for that. And it's complicated even more because the International Olympic Committee has made it clear they have zero interest in the idea of placing the Olympics in one location, zero. They don't even wanna talk about putting it in a, a number of locations around the world. I can tell you that firsthand because a few months back, I had the good fortune of debating the longest serving member of the International Olympic Committee a guy by the name of Richard Pound from Canada, an Olympian in swimming, who's been with the International Olympic Committee, as I say, longer than any other serving member right now. And the question came up from the moderator, what about moving the Olympics around to different places? It was just a non-starter with him. And I think that's representative of the entire body. They like flying around the globe. They like the high flying lifestyle and they're not keen to just have it in one place. They'd tell you, oh, we wanna spread the Olympic spirit far and wide, not just a few places. Uh, but the fact of the matter is they're also living the high life along the way. Hmm. So someone in the chat is asking, what would a new and improved Olympics look like? Or is it time to retire the tradition in favor of something new? I think we just talked enough about that of different ways that, you know, if you could change things, what would you do? So I'm going to put that on hold and see what amount of time we have later, if in case that you want to say more. But I, I before that, someone asked, 
how could we get people like locals slash activists added into the conversation? The Olympic Committee, question mark. If that happened, how would the Olympics look different? So this is like what, you know, you're, you've you been at this for a while. This, you've been critiquing for a while. This person wants to know, okay, how do we get, how do we get these activists more involved? I love that question. And I think what's undergirding that question is how can we enliven democracy and the democratic discussion around the Olympic Games? And the fact of the matter is the Olympics have a serious democracy deficit right now. Let's look at Los Angeles to get some clarity on, on the situation. Back in the spring of 2017, Los Angeles was, as I was talking before, bidding on the 2024 Summer Olympics. And there were some moments during city council meetings when there was time for people to weigh in and testify with their feelings. And anti-Olympics activists did. They weighed in occasionally. Uh, they got a slot, they signed up early and all that stuff. And they got to offer their critiques of the Olympics and say they did not think it was a good idea and did not support it. They were summarily boxed out over time where the city council in Los Angeles created all this space for former Olympians with connections to Los Angeles and without connections to Los Angeles to say whatever they wanted about the Olympics, bring in Carl Lewis, bring in Janet Evans, bring in all these superstar Olympians of yore to talk about how wonderful it would be to have it in Los Angeles. And then they boom, cut off conversation right when uh, activists are, are trying to get their seat at the table. The fact of the matter is, I think that the Olympics, uh, the bid process would benefit a lot from much more open dialogue. And I'll even go further. I think that every single Olympic bid should have a mandatory ballot measure associated with it so that people who live in the Olympic city, who will never be able to afford a ticket to attend an Olympic event, actually do have some say as to whether their city is going to host the Olympics. The International Olympic Committee always tells us how the Olympics are this great thing for the city. It's this really big deal. Okay, if it's such a big deal, then we should have everyday people in the Olympic city, working people get a chance to weigh in and vote on whether they wanna spend public money on such a games. When that's happened in the past, it has meant the scuppering of different Olympic bids. So, um, but also there have been uh, referenda that have passed. I mean, up the road in Vancouver, not that long ago before they hosted the 2010 Winter Olympics, there was a ballot measure and they won. Hey, what can you say after that? At least there was a shred of democracy involved in the process. I think that should become embedded in all Olympic bidding moving forward. Do you know much about Seattle's hosting of the Goodwill Games in, uh, I think it was 1980 or thereabouts? I haven't really looked into that. Were you around for that, Bill? I was, I think it happened right before I moved here. I'm, uh, and and my, my general impression is that it, it, it was sort of well thought of. It had a more you know, high-minded approach is, is the way they thought of it at the time. And there's some people I remember who didn't like, you know, the chain link fences, and, you know, here and there. But my, my, my impression, I can't speak for everyone, is that it was, it was, I don't hear Seattleites clamoring for the Olympics, but that it was considered kind of a, a cool thing that, uh, that that guy, Bob, what's his name, stepped in and did. Yeah, you know, it's funny, there, there have been a number of alternatives to the Olympics over the years. Um, so some people point to the Goodwill Games as this sort of other way of doing things. But if you go way back in Olympic history, there was some fascinating outbursts of activist Olympic Games that were huge alternatives. There were these workers games in the 20s and 30s where mostly socialists and communists from Europe, but also others from around the world came together for these huge sports events that weren't just like massively competitive like the Olympics are that we see this weekend in Beijing but that also had sort of an ethos of camaraderie and working together and not just hyper competition. There were also women's Olympics between 1920s and 1930s as well. Women were boxed out of the Olympics for a long time. They were seen as not having the strength by the IOC saying they didn't have the strength to run in like the 800 meter race. And so they were boxed out. And what they did from that exclusion was they created their own Olympics and they were highly successful. And it put the pressure on the International Olympic Committee to uh, bring them back into the fold, which is what they did. And so I'm very open to the possibilities of alternatives to the Olympic Games. And I think that would actually be a way of getting the International Olympic Committee to take some of these critiques a little bit seriously if they had some competition in the room. Uh, this is a really interesting question here in the chat. 
Uh, I mentioned that you played uh, for the, the U.S. men's national soccer team, the under-23 team, and you were a professional soccer player. Uh, this person says, as a professional athlete, I would think they'd be curious about your, your, um, you know, Olympic, your national team experience. Uh, but this person says, as a professional athlete, were there things you noticed that needed change slash eyebrow raising moments, but didn't truly care enough to look into then? If you were an athlete today, how would your values be different? Oh, wow. I love that question. That's so good. And it also, honestly, it's going to make me feel a little bad because I'm not going to lie to you. When I was 19 years old and I was running up and down the field for the under 23 men's national soccer team in a tournament in France, and I had the good fortune, my first international match was against Brazil. I was not thinking about these bigger issues. I'm actually kind of ashamed to say that now. I was in college, I have no excuse. I should have been thinking about bigger picture issues. But when I was 19 years old, I was running up and down the field and having a good time and doing the best I could. When I turned professional, things started to change for me. I mean, one of the greatest parts for me about being a professional athlete was all the downtime that I had. And I live in Portland, Oregon, and we have an amazing bookstore here in Portland called Powell's. And I didn't live too far from there. And so I basically we'd have practice in the morning and I would sometimes have practice in the afternoon or lift weights in the afternoon. But I had a lot of time where I had to stay off my feet. And that was when I started opening my eyes to some of these bigger questions that we've been talking about tonight, bigger questions of fairness when it comes to sports. And so, you know, I became a vegetarian actually in when I was a professional soccer player. Now in the, in the 1990s, that was a little bit of a bigger deal than it is today. I actually sometimes had a hard time getting food on the road. I ate a lot of iceberg lettuce in Dallas, for example. Um, but to your, to your question, uh, I, I definitely uh, would do things a lot different now. I would be much more outspoken. I would also just study my facts much harder. But here's the thing. When it comes to athlete activism, in other words, I wish I would have been more of an athlete activist and I'm not giving myself any free passes, but here's the thing. When it comes to athlete activism, if you have strong movements around you, strong activist movements, that sort of scythes space for athletes to become athlete activists. And I was involved in anti-war movement. I, I protested in the streets in the 1990s against the Gulf War, for example. Um, but back then, and that gap between then and the protests against the World Trade Organization, the IMF, the World Bank, which people in Seattle know very well from 1999 in the World Trade Organization protests, you know, but in that little gap period was when I was playing professional soccer, and we just didn't have the kind of big, vibrant movements that we have today around Black Lives Matter, around indigenous rights, around all sorts of other really important issues. The Me Too movement is massive and important right now. And when you have those movements, that actually does create space for these athletes. Now, of course, a lot of these athletes too that are professionals now have people on their staff that can do that kind of research work for them and get them up to speed on things. And so that might have been an option if I were playing today as opposed to then, because I would have been making better money if I was playing today than I did in the 1990s. So yes, I would approach things very differently. And you know, there's two things, final things I'll say about it. One is if athletes are not speaking out today, even if they do have those resources at their disposal, even if they do have those movements at their back, I do not get on them about it. You know, not every athlete should be an athlete activist. And in fact, I can tell you, and I don't mean to sound mean or anything, but I played with some guys and I am really thankful that they did not speak out with their political beliefs in the public sphere back then because uh, we were uninformed and they had some pretty uh, outrageous thoughts about things around politics so i don't think everybody has to be an athlete activist but i will say we're living in a really exciting moment right now and i would have loved to have been a part of that where we have more and more athletes who are socially conscious who care about politics and who are speaking out about politics in the public sphere, not just individually, but collectively. And so, yes, I would have loved to have been alive as a professional athlete in this particular moment. Do you think we're gonna see any athlete demonstrations in Beijing? It's a great question. There's a few factors I think people need to be aware of going into the Beijing Olympics. Uh, for starters, there is a rule in the Olympic charter, it's called rule 50, that explicitly outlaws activism at the Olympic games. This rule emerged in the 1970s 
only a couple years after John Carlos and Tommy Smith famously at the 1968 Olympics put their fists in the air uh, to stand for human rights and for black pride. And immediately the International Olympic Committee made a rule that outlawed doing political demonstrations at the Olympics. Because we're riding this exciting zeitgeist of act, uh, athlete activism right now, they were forced, the IOC was, to change that rule just a little bit to create space for athletes to engage in political speech before their events started. So many of you might be thinking, oh yeah, when I was watching the Tokyo Olympics women's soccer, for example, the women took a knee before the match. That was actually legal. Um, but you're still, as an athlete, not allowed, according to Rule 50, to take a political stand when you're on the medal stand or when you're in the middle of competition. Now that didn't stop Raven Saunders, the amazing shot putter from the United States, from putting her arms in the shape of an X at the Tokyo Olympics while on the medal stand, saying that she was doing that in honor of all oppressed people around the world. So anything is possible. But Beijing presents a, a slightly different and more complex picture in the sense that organizers of the Beijing Olympics have stated directly that if somebody does engage in protest there, they can expect to feel the full weight of the law used against them. And the thing about the law, Chinese criminal law, is that things that are illegal there are not necessarily illegal in the United States or Canada or places like that. If you were to talk about Xinjiang province that we were talking about before and raise the issue of the Uyghur Muslims who are living under extraordinarily difficult conditions, experiencing crimes against humanity, you would be breaking a criminal law in China against amplifying separatism. And so the question really is for a lot of these political athletes who are headed to Beijing, and there are plenty of them that are committed to their politics, would they be able to protest? And if they did, would Beijing crack down on them? And if that happened, would the International Olympic Committee have their back? That is a key question that I bet a lot of people right now as I'm talking about that are thinking about the Chinese tennis player Peng Shuai, who only a few months back made credible and serious sexual assault allegations against a higher up in the Chinese government, a former vice premier. And the International Olympic Committee tried to get to the bottom of it, and they had a 30 minute video call with Peng Shuai. And after that 30 minute video call, they decided that everything was just fine nothing to worry about here. Now, of course, anybody who thinks about that situation for more than like five seconds realizes that what was going on outside of her Zoom frame in that video call, for example, anything could have been happening there. And the IOC showed obvious and willful gullibility in that situation to protect their own interest to try to get the games to advance. But the reason why I mention that now is because athletes who are going to Beijing know full well the way the International Olympic Committee acted in the case of Peng Shuai. They basically ran political interference for the Chinese authorities, the International Olympic Committee did. So there'd be athletes that maybe are thinking about acting out, but realize that there's a really good chance that the International Olympic Committee might not have their back if they do. And by the way, <laughs> pardon me, if you're curious to see that video, <laughs> I don't think you can. I don't think uh, that video has been you know, disseminated at all. You'll never see the IOC's con conversation with uh, that tennis player that they pronounce so 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 calming and reassuring um so you can't see athletes raise their arms or make an act or do anything if you're not watching the games you said you'll be watching some of it so uh it sounds like you're not saying that anyone should feel any conflict or guilt about participating in the olympics by watching it and all the ads that they'll see well, I think it's up to each person to make their own decision in terms of where they're at. I mean, for me, this is professional. For me, Olympic athletes reach out to me and, and they maybe read something that I wrote and I've, I've struck up, uh, you know, acquaintances with Olympic athletes and I want to cheer them on. I mean, that's kind of uh, where I'm, I'm coming from here. But, you know, Bob Costas, of all people, the guy who oversaw many Olympic Games uh, on television, he recently called the International Olympic Committee shameless when he was being interviewed by CNN. And this is a guy who staked a lot of his career on the Olympic Games, and he's raising big questions. And I think it really puts the ball in the court of NBC. As you'll know, NBC is the broadcaster for the Olympics here in the United States. They forked over $7.7 billion 
to broadcast the Olympics between 2022 and 2032. In other words, they spent a lot of money on this. They put that money forward in 2014, the year before Beijing was handed the Olympics in 2015. I think for me, one thing I'm going to be watching really carefully is how much does NBC talk about the political context? How much do they talk about what we've been talking about this hour here in this session? I think it is their journalistic duty to do so. I know that the NBC uh, network considers the Olympics entertainment, but they also, NBC, fancies themselves as a news outfit. And there are important news stories, political news stories around the Olympics that people should be aware of if they want to fully understand what's going on with these Beijing games. So one thing I'm going to be watching out for is will they provide that important political context? The fact of the matter is, because of the Biden administration's diplomatic boycott of these Olympics, they actually have permission structured for them to put some pretty critical ideas of China and human rights on the table. It remains to be seen whether they do that, because every time they engage in politics when covering the Olympics, they risk alienating viewers. And let's be clear, there are fewer and fewer primetime viewers of the Olympics. It's becoming not quite a toxic property, but there are there's less and less interest around the Olympics. And so they might not be super eager to start taking chances. Sounds like you have not lined up an, a live interview with uh, NBC for any slots during the games. Well, hey, I mean, uh, no, I have not. Okay. Uh, I do work with a lot of uh, other media outlets that are, are keen to have um, critical discussions and hopefully thought provoking discussions, but not NBC. But I will say this, you know, I was on NBC right here in Portland. I will give credit to the affiliate here, KGW. Uh, which had me on for an extended interview the other day where I raised a lot of the issues that we've been talking about tonight. And so I don't view the sort of corporate media, if you will, as a monolithic entity. I think there are little fractures in that system that allow for people, even people like myself that have critical ideas about the Olympics, to enter the discussion. We're nearing the end of our hour together with Jules Boykoff. Uh, again, the book is No Olympians, Inside the Fight Against Capitalist Mega Sports in Los Angeles, Tokyo, and Beyond. A listener in the chat says, if we were to take out some of the sports in the Olympics, and you talked about the expensive out of reach ones, uh, and you like the idea of bringing tug of war back, this person says, which ones would definitely be kept? What qualifies a sport to be credible enough? Oh, wow. Um, great question. So I think for me, if you keep the logic that I put forth before when I was suggesting to bring back the tug of war, the abiding logic there is that you want to have sports that aren't super expensive, that don't have a lot of startup costs, so that anybody in any part of the world could do them. Now, the Winter Olympics are at a disadvantage because huge swaths of the world really doesn't have access to snow. And that's why, in part, the Olympics in the winter are much smaller, around 3,000 athletes versus the summer that are 11,000 athletes or so. Um, so, I mean, I guess I would start to think about it that way, which are the most expensive sports that are basically for elites. Uh, and I know the equestrian people are going to not be happy for me to talk about it like that. But the fact of the matter is that if they can fork over $70,000 a year to take care of a horse, uh, they're probably doing uh, just fine. Uh, so I would say that, you know, bringing in more sports where everybody can actually play them is, is one possibility. Some folks have put forth the idea of having more running sports in the winter. In other words, like cross country running, but in the Winter Olympics, so like running on snow, and, and there's been actually quite a bit of support for that. Again, anybody, you know, uh, any country could probably get together runners to participate in that kind of thing. So I guess thinking more materially and about money is where I would start, and that's the kind of direction that I would go. You mentioned running on snow, and I wonder, Jules, if you ever feel you're running on ice. Uh, you're, you're not going to be interviewed um, by, by NBC during the games, as far as we know. The games will go on. They're set for years to come in L.A. and Paris and Brisbane. How do you know and how would you know if all your years of critiquing are doing any good? Oh, wow. I can have an existential crisis right at the end of this uh, interview here. Thanks a lot. No, it's a great question. And, you know, you know, I, I do sort of think about that now and again. Um, but the way that I have chosen to go about my life is to abide uh, by my ideals and my values and to do my very best every day to align my sentiments and my actions. And that is not going to make me Mr. Popular in a lot of circles. It's definitely not made me Mr. Popular in Olympic circles. 
but at least when I go to bed at night, I can know that I have remained inside of my own integrity. And for me, that definitely matters. I view fights for justice as long-term fights. And I'm honored to be a part of a fight for justice around the Olympics and other issues that I care about, even though I know that I might not see the fruits of, of victory in my lifetime. But that doesn't mean I'm going to stop fighting here in this lifetime. Our hour is up with Jules Boykoff, author of No Olympians, Inside the Fight Against Capitalist Mega Sports in Los Angeles, Tokyo, and beyond. Any final words you want to leave us with? Something we didn't get a chance to talk about? Or otherwise, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll give you the, the, the last word. Oh, you know, I think we have covered so much ground, Bill, and I'm just grateful for this opportunity to have this talk with you. And thank you to all the people who ask questions. Big thanks to Shinyi Pai, who invited me in the first place here, and to the wonderful folks at the Seattle Town Hall. I just want to say it's been a joy to work with you. Thanks to everybody for coming, and I'm uh, just honored to have this time with you. Thank you. I'll turn it over to, to Town Hall, Seattle, and um, you know anything we need to add besides saying what a pleasure it's been uh, for me to be with Jules Boykoff and with you, Town Hall, and, and for all of your great questions. Yes, thank you, Bill, so much. It's so nice to have you back here at Town Hall and lead this discussion. And Jules, thank you for sharing your story and your perspective. And it's very interesting to see this take on someone who has you know the credibility and the experience. So thank you for sharing yourself with us. Thank you. Yes, and to all of our viewers at home, please purchase a copy of the book in the link could be found in our chat over at our friends at Elite Bay Book Company. Both of you have a great night and everyone at home, take care. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye, Thank Jules. you. Okay, thanks so much, Bill. Thanks everybody.